everyone, and this is BioPhoenix here, and today we're gonna do something very different for this horror review. But one thing I want to get out of the way first is that originally I was planning to do a Super Nintendo RPG called Dark Half, but unfortunately I ran into some issues and then I had to scrap the project. It really is unfortunate that I had to go that way, but it is what it is, and with that said, I gotta move on to something else, and I decided to pick something that is not only very weird, but also something that is probably gonna be very challenging to review. And the reason I say this is that, as of right now, this game has yet to be translated. And that happens to be Athena Awakening from the Ordinary Life. It was released in 1999 on the PS1, and it was developed by Yumi Kobo and published by SNK, of course. Since this game is a part of SNK's Athena series, or what she's most known for is being in the King of Fighters. So I'm sure most of you are aware of this, but Athena has gotten a few games on her own before she appeared in King of Fighters, and this one is probably one of the weirdest ones ever, mostly because, believe it or not, this is actually a survival horror. Well, kinda sorta. It's more or less an adventure game with the same basic stuff that you do in a survival horror, but this one is actually a lot more darker than any of the other Athena games, so that's why I'm including it here. Now one random thing I do want to mention here, because I thought it was kind of amusing, is that SNK did indeed publish another horror-related game, and that happened to be, uh, Kudelka. Which just happens to be the pre-successor to Shadowheart, so that's pretty fucking awesome, and I was planning on doing a review on that one as well, but I think I might do that one next year, since I figured I might also take a look at the weirder title. So now let's begin with talking about the Athena's story, and you gotta bear in mind here that because this game is only in Japanese, it is pretty limited to know, but I have looked into it quite a bit. So here's my understanding of it all. So it's the year 2018, and there has been some scientists that were trying to create some uh, DNA fragments of some dinosaurs and other weird stuff. So within next year, when we start hearing about dinosaurs appearing out of nowhere, well, at least we now know the reason for it. Well, getting back on track, the government is hiding all this dark stuff from everyone else, but apparently they picked up some brainwaves of a schoolgirl that just happened to be Athena. So in case you don't know already, this game is pretty much an origin story of Athena and how she got her powers, since, you know, in the King of Fighters she used stuff like Psycho Ball, Psycho Reflector, and Psycho Sword, although sadly there's no Psycho Sword in this game. So it's a pretty average day at high school where Athena and her best friend Rika want to go to a dinosaur museum that happens to be underwater. But before getting there, Athena realizes that something strange happened where someone dropped a bunch of books onto her, and before it ends up hitting her, she ends up deflecting it and disintegrating the books. And since she is unaware of the powers that she has, she thought that was just very strange. So anyways, after when uh, Athena and Rika end up going to the underwater dinosaur museum, the Loch Ness Monster starts attacking the elevator going down and of course making some big destructions going on with the underwater museum. So after this, this is where things get a little bit confusing for me, but from my understanding is that there's actually two sides to groups that are after her. So there is a jester named Asteros, where apparently he has the same psychic abilities as Athena and he always wants to toy with her. And then the other side of it is WAD, aka World Army Defense, which are trying to capture Athena for her powers. So not only Athena herself are stuck between these two situations, but also Rika gets involved too. And as what you might expect, the character Sai also does appear in this one, where he mostly wants to help Athena out whenever he can. But sadly, there's no drunken chin in this game. So that's the best of my abilities to help explain the story. But if I say so myself, I think that's a pretty decent understanding of the story for someone that doesn't really know much Japanese. But I will touch base a bit more later, so now let's start talking about the gameplay. So as I said about this game being sorta of like a survival horror is that it does have the same mechanics as one. So you walk around with tank controls where there's also uh, polygons over pre-rendered backgrounds, and you also gotta collect key items, notes, and even food for health. And there are many puzzles throughout the game, and surprisingly enough, a lot of the puzzles were very easy to understand. 
Well, except for one, and that happens to be one where you gotta put together a kanji symbol, where you gotta put different pieces together in the right order, and uh, if that's not hard enough, you gotta do three of them, and to make matters even worse, is that you gotta do it all in a time limit. Yeah, that one fucking sucked, but the rest of them weren't so bad. And you also gotta talk to NPCs to get some clues on what you're supposed to do and where you're supposed to go and all that sort of stuff. And obviously, I had to use a guide for this one because there was no way I could have done this without it. And speaking of NPCs, one of the other things that you can do in this game is that whenever you go up to an NPC, you can actually read their minds. And you do that by seeing that one thing in the corner up here where you gotta press the triangle button or the square button at the right time. In fact, this game has a lot of rhythm elements to it as well, where not only do you use this to uh, do the mind reading, but you also do some puzzles with it too. And whenever you make a mistake at these rhythm segments, then you lose a little bit of health due to psychic backlash. But probably one of the weirdest parts about this game is the kind of sort of action that it has. So unfortunately, there's not a whole lot of action that happens within this game. You're not running away from zombies or anything like that. So whenever there's a boss fight or whenever you're running away against a mech, they have these sections that are kind of like quick time events where you get to choose either stay, duck, or move in certain directions. And of course, you can use your attacks at certain parts. I guess the easiest way to explain it is that it's sort of like an FMV game where you pick the action and depending on what you pick could either get yourself killed or get yourself safe or you can get yourself prepared for doing an attack. And thankfully it is very easy to understand since the game's symbols are all indicated very easily. So yeah, there's not a whole lot of combat within this game but whenever there is one it's sort of like an FMV game. So that sums up the gameplay, where it's pretty much more or less of an adventure game, although I do consider it to be somewhat horror because the game is much more darker in tone. And whenever you die in this game, the game over screen is always going to be different, where you actually get to see yourself get killed, or whoever else get killed. Two examples that I'll give just for the shit of it is that there's one ending that you can get where you get to sink the entire museum, and then there's another one where you get to blow up the entire school. Yeah, shit gets crazy later on. So now let's talk about the controls, and I think they're alright for the most part. And like I already said in the last review of uh, Galarian's is that I found that tank controls in these sort of games are actually okay, I don't really mind them there. But the only issue I have with them here is that you always seem to get stuck on the something, which does get kind of annoying. And especially the fact that I played this game not long after clearing out Galarian's. And there were a couple items that were kind of tricky to pick up because they were placed in such an awkward spot. But other than that, everything else is very easy to understand, and of course, the rhythm game parts are also pretty easy to know. Although, when I first did them, it did take me a little bit of time to get used to the pattern of it, considering that it is different than most other rhythm games that I've played, but once I got used to it though, it actually does work pretty well. But other than that, it's all pretty easy stuff to understand. Like I said, the only two issues I have with this game is that sometimes you get stuck on the things, and also the item placements can be a little bit annoying. So now let's get moving on to other things, like the graphics. And I find them to be pretty mixed for many reasons. So first, let's talk about the good. So I really like all the different settings that this game has, and I also really like the, uh, the pre-rendered backgrounds. I still think they look really nice. And one thing that is interesting about the museum is that it was actually sort of related to the museum stage in King of Fighters 99, which ironically enough came out the same year as this game. And I do find that the cutscenes do look pretty good for the time. And the overall design of the game is actually pretty decent, but the one issue I do have with the graphics is that the 3D models of this game just don't look nearly as good as everything else. Now yes, whenever it comes to PS1 games, you gotta understand like the limitations and what it could do at that time. But for 1999, this game looks like something that came out in the year 95-96, you know, early on in the PS1's life. Now going back to Galarian's for a sec, in Japan, that game came out the same year as this game, and that game's 3D models looked way better. I don't know what it is, it just looked kind of muddy looking, which I guess you could argue the fact that it does suit with the game, how it's supposed to like look all like dark and gritty-ish. And that's a good point and all, but I do find that it does need a little bit more detail on them. But since this game has a shitload of cutscenes, at least it did get the 3D on that one look fine. And speaking of that, the first disc is mostly cutscenes if you could believe it. So overall, I find that the graphics for this one are alright, they're not the best looking ever, but they're also not the worst either. I mean, I've seen way worse looking PS1 games than this. 
But I'd say it's a little bit more good than bad, since I do like the pre-rendered backgrounds a lot. So now let's get moving on and start talking about the music. And personally, I actually really like the music within this game. I think it suits with the game very well, and of course I find some of the songs, they get kind of stuck in my head every once in a while. And some of them do sound a little bit relaxing, which is quite nice. But I do have one unfortunate thing to say about the music is that the songs are pretty short and they do loop pretty quickly, much like in the game Lost Kingdoms, which is another game where I do like its OST, but I wish the songs were a little bit longer. But one little thing I do want to mention about the music is that unfortunately, I can't find most of the songs on YouTube, which really sucks. Because I find that this game's OST is pretty underrated, especially for an SNK title. But at least there is one short song and a couple extended versions, which is very nice that are uploaded, but I really wish someone like ripped the music from the game and then uploaded it or something, at least that would be nice. Hell, I'd do it myself if I knew how to do it, but anyways, now nah, I'm just bitching about random shit. But anyways, overall from the music, I do really like it, and yeah, that one complaint that I mentioned about the songs being pretty short, it's a minor thing, and honestly, I still like it for what it is. Now it's for the game's voice acting. Now, as you would suspect, this game is all in Japanese. Well, actually, I gotta say corrected here is that this game is 95% Japanese and 5% English. And you're probably wondering, why the fuck is there 5% English in this game? The only parts that have English in this game is the very beginning part of the intro. Yeah, doesn't that seem weird that like only one part of the game has English and the rest of it is Japanese? It makes me wonder if this game was originally going to come outside of Japan but then got cancelled and they just said, ah screw it, we'll just leave this part the way it is. Now I am fully aware that the Japanese version of Resident Evil has English voice acting in it since the game does take place in America, so that makes sense. But then you get really weird ones like Pepsi Man where the game is all in English and even the live action parts and hell, those parts are even filmed in America, so I don't know. It's just one of those weird things that just can't be explained. But for all you Athena fans out there, it is good to know that the staple voice of Athena does play in this game, which happens to be Haruna Ikazawa. But other than that, I really can't say much about it since I don't know if this is really considered good or bad voice acting in Japanese, but I can at least say that it is good to know that they did kept the same typical voice for her. So now, if you were to buy this one, well, I have not seen that many copies on eBay, but from the ones that I have seen, the game does seem to be pretty affordable, so you got two of them going for about $20, and then you got another one for $35, and then another one for $40, and then you got a sealed one going for $120, and you can even buy the strategy guide for it for $20. Also, it is worth noting that you can get it off PS3's PSN with a Japanese account since it is available on there. But typically speaking, if you do want to buy a copy of this game, and if you do have a way to play Japanese PS1 games, then it's not too overly priced. And to be perfectly honest, I thought this game was going to be a lot more than that just because of how obscure it is. Now, before I get into my overall thoughts on this game, one random fact about this game is that it actually did have a live-action TV series much later on called Athena. Now I haven't officially seen it, but just from looking into it a little bit, it seems kind of similar to this game's story in a weird way, but in another way it kind of seems a little bit different. I don't know, I can't really say a whole lot about it. But it is there for those of you that do want to check it out. So now, as for my overall thoughts on this game, I found it to be fairly decent. Not amazing, but I thought it was alright. Now, given the fact that I don't fully understand most of the story since I couldn't read most of the dialogue, but one thing I can say is that the story was kind of interesting, but at the same time, it did seem a little bit all over the place. Just for one example, whenever you get out of the museum section, it goes to a train section, and I'm not sure exactly how it transitions well into that, but like I said, it could have to do with the fact that I couldn't read the dialogue. But one thing I knew for sure about the story was that I was not really bored with it. I was kind of interested to see how it all played out, and I also did uh, kind of like watching the cutscenes. But as for the gameplay though, like, I didn't mind the whole exploration and adventuring and the puzzles, I thought those were alright, except for that one puzzle, fuck that one. But the kind of sorta action scenes were pretty underwhelming. Now, they weren't like the worst, like, excruciating thing I ever had to deal with in a video game, but I just felt like kind of bored with them. It would have been pretty awesome if they made it play similar to Galarian's with the whole uh, psychic powers thing, but sadly it seems like it was not meant to be. But despite that though, I still think the game is pretty decent for the most part. It's not great, but it's definitely not bad. 
I'd say it's more of an interesting take on something that's just so freaking random that you probably wouldn't think actually happened, but it did. And it kind of makes me wonder if SNK will ever do any more spin-off games to any of their characters from KOF, or even do more with the Athena character. Now as for recommendations, this one's kind of hard to recommend since obviously for one, the game's only in Japanese as of right now, and I know most people don't want to play a Japanese only game and looking at a guide and such. And I think the only people that would really, really dig into this game are people that really like the Athena character, or people that are really big into SNK, or if you just really want to try something that's very different for an adventure style kind of game. But for me personally, if you do want to try this game out, I think it would be best to wait until a fan translation comes out. I really hope there is one someday, because I actually would not mind replaying the game again, although I wouldn't do another review on it, instead I'd probably do a stream on it. So that sums up the Athena Awakening from the Ordinary Life is that this game is definitely not ordinary. Just like this review, because normally I wouldn't review something like this unless it had a translation. But I did happen to beat the game, even though it was mostly done through a walkthrough, but still, I did manage to get through it, and so can you. So with that being said, that'll be the end of this review, so thanks for watching, commenting, and have yourselves a great day.